Austin came out of the operating room, took off his robe and cap, and sat down tiredly on the couch. He had no strength at all. His eyes were slipping. His back was aching from standing for so long. However, he was pleased with himself. The most complicated operation had gone perfectly. The doctor was already scrolling in his head through the consultation he had planned for tomorrow, when suddenly his phone rang. It was his wife. "'Honey, how are you? Is everything okay? You are late tonight,' worried Heather. "'Don't worry, my dear. I'm all done. I'll be home soon.' The doctor smiled and hurried off to change. As he stepped outside, he breathed in the cool February air with his full chest and thought how lucky he was to have a wife, a daughter, and a career. Austin was the leading surgeon in the well-known, all-over-the-city, prestigious hospital. He had an excellent reputation. Patients signed up for consultations a month in advance. At the same time, the doctor was very tactful and modest. Fame and success did not spoil him. From childhood, his parents taught him to be a good man. Remember, son, everyone should be treated with tenderness and love, with kindness and affection, whether animal or human. It doesn't matter if the person is rich or poor. If you can help him, then help him without hesitation. Austin was brought up in love and prosperity. There was always a quiet, peaceful environment in his family. His mother respected and honoured his father. There was never any scandals or yelling. As Austin grew up in a family of doctors, he was attracted to medicine from an early age. After school, he did not hesitate and went to medical university, graduating it with honours. Heather was a cheerful girl with a long plait of hair. She was brave and determined. They met at a university party. Austin was very shy. In addition, he considered himself an unattractive, tall, four-eyed man. He literally burned Heather with his eyes, watching her dancing and laughing with her friends, but he did not dare approach her. When the slow dance came, Heather approached him herself. Let's go dance. You can't take your eyes off me, she said firmly and winked. They never parted again. After graduation, Heather worked as a paediatrician and then gave birth to a daughter, Molly. The little girl grew up smart from early years, loved to sing, so by her ten years she was playing the piano rather well, pleasing her parents in the evenings. So Austin and his family lived harmoniously and amicably. But soon there was an event that divided his life forever into a before and after. It was an ordinary shift. A heavy patient was brought in by ambulance. He was an elderly man in his sixties. He was dressed in a shabby summer jacket, obviously unsuitable for cold February. The man looked unkempt and haggard, and he had tattoos on his hands that spoke of his prison past. The man was delirious and writhing in pain. After examining the patient, Austin determined that he had appendicitis and ordered to prepare him for an emergency operation. At the door of the operating room, a nurse came up to him and held out something. Dr. Morgan, look, this picture fell out of the patient's breast pocket when we were undressing him. I think this guy looks kind of like you. Austin picked up the old, worn-out picture and froze in shock. It was him in his youth in the picture. That can't be, this is crazy. Where did this man get my picture? wondered the man. After managing to cope with the shiver in his hands, the surgeon entered the operating room. Two hours later, everything ended safely. From that very minute, Austin was literally counting the minutes until the patient regained enough to be able to talk to him. The doctor became exhausted, asking himself a thousand questions and not finding an answer. From the documents, he knew that the man's name was Carl Snyder, but this name did not mean anything to Austin. He constantly took out of his briefcase that photo as if he wanted to make sure once again that he was mistaken. But no, it was his face. At home, the surgeon pulled out an old album and began leafing through it frantically. Austin, what's wrong with you? Has something happened? You haven't been yourself all day. What are you looking for there? Worriedly asked his wife. Don't worry, sweetheart, everything's fine. 
I just wanted to see some old pictures. Look how young and beautiful we are here. The man quickly changed the subject, not wanting to disturb his wife. The picture was of him and Heather back in his student days. Austin discreetly slipped it into his briefcase. Finally, the patient was transferred to therapy from the intensive care unit. The doctor decided to visit the man and find out everything. He quickly entered the room. The elderly man was sitting on the bed and looking sadly out the window. Good afternoon, how are you feeling? My name is Austin, I was your surgeon. Better now, thank you. I'm deeply grateful to you. Thank you very much. Listen, I need to have a serious talk to you. When we took off your jacket before the operation, this photo fell out of your pocket, said Austin, and put it in front of the patient. Who is this young man? Oh, thank God you found it, and I thought I'd lost it forever. Thank you, said the man with a smile, and gently stroked the picture. This is my son, Tommy. He passed away recently. I was just going to order a gravestone for his grave, but I suddenly felt bad. At this point, tears came to the elderly man's eyes. Okay, but then look at this photo, said Austin, and pulled out his picture with Heather. How do you explain this? How is that possible? The man suddenly looked intently into the surgeon's eyes and turned pale. So, it was you, son, who saved my life. That's how it happens in life. So many years have passed and finally I see you. Thank you. And forgive me if you can. What are you talking about? I'm not your son. My parents are alive, thank God. Explain yourself, please, said Austin, getting angry. Of course, I'll tell you everything, but I can't do it in a few words. It's a long talk. I'm in no hurry. My shift's over. It turned out that Mr. Snyder was an orphan. After graduation, he got a job at a construction site as a plasterer. That's where he found his bride, Regina. She was brought up by her grandmother. They lived very poorly. They started dating and then living together. Soon, Regina realized that she was pregnant with twins. The couple got married and rejoiced, of course, but a rare, fatal complication happened during delivery, and the young woman died right on the operating table. Mr. Snyder took his sons from the maternity hospital, but he had no idea what to do with them and how to live further. He had no relatives, and Regina only had an elderly grandmother of 80. He was practically going crazy from the constant baby crying, had no time for anything. He almost did not sleep, and clearly realized for himself that he would not be able to support two children. He began to puzzle over what to do. He did not want to send his sons to the orphanage. He had been through this hell himself, and knew how hard it was to live there. It was at this point that his acquaintances told him about a wealthy family of doctors who wished to adopt a baby, but only in a way that no one would know. In those days, nobody knew about surrogacy. Dr. Snyder grasped his chance like a straw. The family was good and well-to-do. It would be better for the son than fighting in an orphanage for a piece of bread. And money wouldn't hurt. At least it would help to raise a second son. Though the little boys were twins, Tom was stronger, while Austin was skinny, tiny, cried without a pause, and ate badly. So, Mr. Snyder decided to give Austin to them. He certainly would not be able to put him on his feet. Mr. Snyder promised not to make inquiries about his child, not to look for him, and in general, to forget about his existence. Then, the man was given a fake document that his deceased wife had only one child and a large sum of money. Mr. Snyder heard nothing more about either little Austin or his adoptive parents. He promised to leave, so he packed up his small belongings, took his son, and moved to a neighbouring town. Mr. Snyder raised Tom as best he could, taking on any part-time jobs. But unfortunately, he was failing at raising Tom as a decent man. Apparently, it happened because of his constant absence for jobs. In general, since childhood, Tom was a troublemaker. He would break a window at school or get F grades. 
After school, he got mixed up with the local gang and did not want to work. One day, he and his friends stole a motorcycle. Tom was facing a serious prison term, so Mr. Snyder decided to take his blame, so as not to ruin his son's fate by going to jail. He went to prison for three years, thinking that his son would appreciate what he had done and would start a new life. But no, Tom continued to be friends with suspicious individuals, and recently he was hit by a car and died. I'm happy for you, son. You're obviously a clever and good man, since you've got such a job and you're saving people. So maybe it was for the best, finished Mr. Snyder, his sad tale. Austin was in shock. A storm of emotions overwhelmed him. He didn't know what to say, how to react, how to live with it at all. I need to think it over. Excuse me, I'll come to you later, was all Austin could squeeze out. Not remembering himself, he rushed home to his beloved wife. Only she could now help him make the right decision. Austin excitedly and confusedly told Heather everything. Can you imagine? Why didn't anyone tell me anything before? All my life my parents kept quiet, and I couldn't understand why I was nothing like them, and they kept telling me that I looked like my grandfather. What a cynicism! And this Mr. Snyder is no better than them. He told his son, and did not remember about me all his life. With each word, Austin grew angrier and angrier. Heather went to the cupboard, took out the cognac, poured it into a shot glass and handed it to her husband. So, here's the deal, my dear. Everything you just said is emotion. So now you will drink it, take a hot bath and go to sleep. And in the morning, with a clear head, we'll talk. Austin listened to his wise wife and so he did. In the morning, the couple continued their conversation. Well, now listen to what I think. Don't accuse anyone of anything. And don't you dare tell your parents anything. It would be a terrible pain for them. Look, they have nurtured you all these years, brought you up decently, educated you. You are their pride and support. What is their fault? Now imagine if you'd stayed with your own father. What would you have become? What could he give you? So thank fate that things turned out this way and nothing else. That's my opinion. But I will support you in any case, said Heather, and kissed her husband on the cheek. Austin thought about his wife's words. Indeed, God only knows what Mr. Snyder went through, giving me up forever to a strange family and knowing that he would never see me again. It is also a kind of courage to keep a promise and not once come close and not to know how your son is. It is obvious that he is not a bad person. It's just that his fate was so unfortunate. And I should bow down to my parents for a happy, untroubled childhood. After careful consideration, Austin made a decision, and his heart immediately felt better. After buying all sorts of goodies and normal clothes on the way to work, Austin visited Mr. Snyder. He sat down next to him and said, Father, I'm sorry I reacted that way yesterday. I had to come to terms with that news. I want to thank you, even though you didn't raise me. But without you and Mum, I wouldn't be in this world. I am not offended by you. Let me hug you, said Austin, and hugged the elderly man tightly. Mr. Snyder cried, unable to contain his emotions. After all, he had never hoped he would ever meet his Austin again. Dad, don't worry about anything. I'll help you. I'll introduce you to your granddaughter and my wife when you're discharged. You're not alone now. You've got family next to you. My parents who brought me up are as dear to me as you are. I will never leave them. Do you understand? Yes, of course, son, I understand. I am ready to bow down to these people myself, because they raised such a great man, said the elderly man, and he wept again. After discharge, the first thing Austin and Mr. Snyder did 
was they went and ordered a nice gravestone for Tom and his mother, who never got to see her children. After a while, Austin decided to invite Mr. Snyder to his home. Upon entering the apartment, the elderly man was noticeably nervous and shy, but the wise Heather took everything into her own hands. Well, Mr. Snyder, come on in, don't be shy. Molly, come and get acquainted. Here's your grandpa, Carl. The little girl looked at the man inquisitively. Hi, Mom, I already have two grandfathers, she asked incomprehensively. Well, you see how lucky you are. All your friends have one, maximum two grandfathers, and you have three. Everyone will be jealous, laughed Heather. It's really great. Grandpa, do you want me to play the piano? I already know ten compositions, said the child with a smile. Of course, little girl, said the elderly man. The evening passed very warmly and cordially. As Mr. Snyder said goodbye, he couldn't hold back his tears. Thank you for inviting me. I do not remember when I was in such a warm family environment, he emotionally said. A few days later, Austin visited his parents. His mother was happy, hugged him, ruffled his hair as in his childhood. Then they drank tea and cake, laughed and remembered Austin's childhood. And the man realized that these people will always be the closest and dearest to him. It just can't be any other way.